Savior, especially any visitors we have with us this morning. It's wonderful to have you here. Uh, before I give my announcements, is there anyone who has announcements for the good of the congregation? I'll turn the song for you. Good morning, ladies of the congregation. February the 5th, a Saturday, we're going to meet at Sweet Peas at 12 o'clock for our LWML meeting, Secret Angel Reveal. So all ladies, whether you're a member or not, whether you want to participate in the Secret Angel, please come join us. Sweet Peas, uh, 305. At noon. At noon. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you. Uh, I know everyone remembers because I see a lot of food in the kitchen, but immediately after uh, service, we'll have our potluck, and please everybody stay and give a send-off to the Fowlers and welcome Eric and, uh, to church. So everybody's planning on staying and having lunch. Well, again, good morning and uh, welcome, and it's all wonderful to have you here. Looking forward to the potluck today. Just a couple quick announcements from me. Uh, one is that if you haven't heard, we do have our uh, Sunday school started up now. So on Sunday mornings, every Sunday morning, we're starting at 9 a.m. Everyone together out here for a Sunday school opening. Uh, we're singing songs. We're learning the catechism. We're learning the Bible. It's a lot of fun. And then the kids are going off uh, with uh, various teachers to uh, learn Bible stories and color and all the good stuff. So uh, if you have kids or if you know people who have kids, uh, be sure to uh, come and join us for that every uh, Sunday. And for the adults, we're going through Bible history. Um, we're kind of in Solomon's reign right now, and we're going to be looking at the book of Proverbs next week, uh, which is going to be fantastic. So join us for that. Uh, also, every Wednesday, we're still doing Lutheranism 101, 7 p.m. every Wednesday night. Uh, please join us for that. We just finished up, uh, or we're, we're about, to, yeah, we, we finished up Church and Safe, and now we're talking about what are pastors? Uh, what is the purpose of pastors? Uh, what are they in the Bible? Uh, what is basically my job? So um, if you're interested in you know, what I do all week, um, I, I do work more than just one day a week, uh, contrary to popular belief. So uh, if you're interested in what I do all week, come join us for that uh, right now on Wednesdays. Also, um, I have had no one take me up on this yet, but I'm going to keep announcing it until someone takes me up on it. Epiphany is a time for house blessings. Uh, so you can read that announcement in your bulletin, and if you would like to schedule a house blessing, then call or email me. Epiphany is getting close to being over, uh, so I am expecting a phone call this week. Um, someone, someone better do it. Uh, it'll be fun. It'll be fun. I guess I'll just bless my own house again if no one does it. So uh, that's about all the announcements I have. Uh, one other quick announcement is uh, that I will be in Alabama tomorrow for a one-day pastors conference. So if you need me tomorrow, um, you can reach me by, by phone or by text. Um, if you have an absolute emergency, just call me and we'll figure something out. Uh, but I will be uh, out of town tomorrow, but I'll be back tomorrow night, so um, just so everyone is aware. And, and finally, also I almost forgot to announce, um, Judy mentioned it, Eric Pewter is joining us as a member today. He's transferring here from Tupelo. Uh, Mississippi, and uh, his wife Allison um, is also going to be visiting with us regularly, and they are expecting child number one in April. April. Okay, so um, another Lutheran. Another Lutheran. If everyone hasn't heard yet, we're expecting a boy in May, so make sure it's a girl, that way we can, you know, arrange marriages, yeah, that's, we're all for that here. Alright, uh, sorry for the long announcements, God's blessing on your worship today.
Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He made us still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. I'll give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his steadfast love endures forever. Let them remain the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of men. They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep. Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, O sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has fallen upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. And they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation, and where do you come from? What is your country, and of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. And he said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea, then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not. For the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord! Let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. This is the word of the Lord. We read Psalm 96 responsibly. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell us salvation from day to day. Tell us your name. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord, and great is the Lord. He is the beauty of all God. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols. The Lord made the heavens. 
Ascribe to the Lord our families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar in all that fills it. Before the Lord, for he comes, for he comes to judge the earth. Romans chapter 13. Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. This is the word of the Lord. Stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. <laughs> by the waves, but he was asleep. And they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, for we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Then he rose and rebuked the wind and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is the gospel of the Lord. into Nineveh after the great fish had spit him out, and he walks into the city, walks just a little bit into the city, not very far, only about halfway to where the people actually are, and he just screams, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. He just calls out like he was told to, and the crazy thing, the absolutely crazy thing there is that it works. Whenever Jonah goes to call out to the city, the people actually repent. The king hears of it. He calls for a fast. He calls for sackcloth and ashes. And the people repent. And Nineveh, a once greatly evil city, becomes now a greatly righteous city. All he had to do was call out. All he had to do was say one simple thing. 
And that is perhaps the main, but at least the first of many lessons that we can learn from this reading in Jonah today. While you are not all called technically to be missionaries or evangelists, not in the sense that I am called to be a public evangelist, we are about evangelism here, and specifically in this church about revitalization, as we often talk about. And Jonah is a great evangelism, or even a revitalization book. Nineveh was successfully revitalized there in that time. And you can learn a lot about the message that is given to them so that that happens from the book of Jonah. Paul asks in Romans, how can they believe if they have not heard? And so often in terms of evangelism or in terms of revitalization, we often lament how few believers they are. We often think about how people need to hear the gospel, and we'll talk about all these strategies and all these methods and all these programs that we could use to go out and reach the people, that we could use to go out and spread the gospel. But sometimes I think it just gets a little too complicated. The message that Jonah has is a simple one. And the command that he has given is a simple one. You don't have to make it all that complicated. Sometimes you just have to call out and you just have to say what you believe to be true. And this also happens not just when he goes into the city of Nineveh, but this happens later on on the boat. He simply says who he is, where he came from, who his God is, what his God is like, and what needs to be done about it. You don't have to always have it be so complicated. Sometimes you just need to say, I believe in God the Father Almighty, who made heaven, heaven and earth, and in His Son, Jesus Christ, who God sent here to be born of a man, fully God, fully man, who redeemed me by His precious blood, shed for me on the cross. God created heaven and earth to work in a certain way. We have not lived up to that, and so His Son has to save us from our punishment. And because of that, we will live with him eternally. It's the whole gospel. One paragraph, a couple sentences, not that complicated. But we like to make it complicated. We like to think that it is too scary. We like to think that it's going to take way too much and that they're probably, like Jonah thought, they're probably not going to listen anyway, so why even try? Why even put in the effort of the few sentences that it will take? Why even go and call out? And so, like Jonah, we flee from ever even trying. Now when Jonah flees from where God is sending him, when Jonah flees, he is fleeing to a far away place. He is fleeing to a place where he thinks that he can hide from God. And it is an interesting thing that he does this, because there really is no hiding from God. And he is called to a specific place. He is called to the place of Nineveh. But he tries to flee to a far away place, to a place where he thinks he can hide from God. And so often we also act in that same way. Now we are not called to be, like I said earlier, we are not called to be foreign missionaries like Jonah is. So the first thing you have to do is ask yourself, well, where has God actually called you to? Where has God actually called you to? And if he hasn't called you to be a foreign missionary, if he hasn't sent you to a far away place, then he has probably called you to simply be where you are. And we also see this with Jonah later on, that he does end up evangelizing to the people that he is with on the boat. This is the Lutheran doctrine of vocation. That God, God has called you to certain stations in life, whether he has called you to be a mother, a father, a grandmother, a grandfather, a son, a daughter, a brother, a cousin, a co-worker, a fellow church member. He has called you to all these different places in life. And when you interact with people in those places in life, you are called 
to be with them and to say to them the simple message that you are given to say. To simply proclaim in those places what you are given to say. But like Jonah, so often we try and flee to places where we think that maybe those people can't see us, or especially that God can't see us in those places. And this is not, he is trying to flee ultimately from how the text says it, from the presence of the Lord. And when you put it that way, it sounds so silly that he would try and flee. Because you really can never flee from the presence of where God is. Oftentimes we might try and rationalize it in this way, and Jonah tried to rationalize it in this way, that it was kind of an arbitrary, specific place that God had chosen, and he'd rather go to a different, arbitrary, specific place. It was like God had said, you should go to Panera Bread, but he was like, no, I'd rather have a tropical smoothie or something like that. But that's not actually how the presence of the Lord works. That's not actually how the presence of the Lord works. And that is because the presence of the Lord works in this way. That when you have faith, when you know that God is present in a place, and He is present everywhere, and when you are part of that body of Christ, you are called to mission as part of your faith. The mission that Jonah was on was not something that he could simply leave and do it somewhere else. The mission that he was on was commanded by God, and it was simply part of being a part of who God is as one of his children. And so when we think about mission and evangelism, I think so often, especially when we think about all these strategies and all these programs, and even when we start to think about foreign missionaries and the specific places that they go, we forget to think of it simply about being part of being in the presence of the Lord. That our faith, knowing this gospel, knowing Christ, it demands that we share this message. It is impossible to hide from. You cannot know the joys and blessings of the gospel. You cannot know Christ and then simply pretend like it doesn't really matter, like it's arbitrary if my unbelieving neighbor or my unbelieving co-worker or my unbelieving family member does not find out about that same message. You cannot know how important it is in your life and then pretend like it's not important in their life, like it's just a matter of where you go out to eat that day. You cannot know the Lord's presence in His means of grace coming from this church, coming from this altar, coming from this font, coming from this pulpit, and then pretend like it doesn't matter if the other people in the Soto County and the surrounding areas ever come here and hear that message. It is simply part of those things. The gospel is proclaimed so that it can be heard. The supper is administered so that it can be received in the mouth. It is simply part of the Christian life. And going down and hiding, going down into the bottom part of a ship, going down deep under the covers of your bed, going deep hours into the Netflix show, trying to hide from the presence of the Lord so that you wouldn't have to go out and talk to people, God forbid, it simply does not work. Because the presence of the Lord is still there. He knows the deepest thoughts of mankind. And Jonah is kind of insane. He thinks that it would work. And to wake up Jonah from this insane idea, the Lord sends a violent storm. Now it's revealed in this story that the storm is because of Jonah's disobedience. But put yourself in the mariner's perspective for a second. Put yourself in the mariner's shoes. They don't know why the storm is happening. Storms are simply a part of sea fare. And so they do as they normally do. They start to cry out, each to their own God. And when you think about mission, when you think about revitalization, you're thinking about the people that you're going to talk to, realize that this happens to them too. When the afflictions and the storms and the sufferings of life come to everyone, Whatever God's purpose for those storms is, that they may or may not know, 
or that you may or may not know. Whenever those storms come to people, they are going to start to try and deal with it in their own way. They are going to try and cry out to their own God. If it's an illness, they're going to look for a medicine or a vaccine, probably today. If it is stormy weather, they're going to read the weather channel. They're going to look to the gods of science, and they're going to try and climb down in their storm shelter. And there's nothing wrong with that, per se. If it's a problem of poverty, they're going to look to either government programs or to their family to help them out. If it is depression, then they're going to go to the psychologist, which, by the way, means soul doctor. They're going to go to their soul doctors, and they're going to try and heal their souls by looking deeper and deeper into themselves with whatever modern science says. And some of those things are fine, and some of those things can be good, but what they're not going to do is turn to the true Lord. They're not going to turn to the one who can ultimately and actually help. They're not going to turn to the one who actually makes those other things work if they do, in fact, work. And so the mariners are crying out to their own God, but they're never crying out to the Lord. And the sad thing here is that Jonah, who knows who could actually help, Jonah, who knows who the true Lord is, who could say a prayer that would actually be heard, unlike their prayers, he is asleep. He is just down in the ship, sleeping, out of selfish pride. Out of selfish pride, he is not crying out, he is not praying, he is not going to the true God. And there's a funny thing about sleep here in these readings. If you compare the reading of Jonah and then the gospel reading where Jesus is the one asleep in a boat, there are two types of sleep, two types of rest that you can have in the Christian life. First of all, there is the Jonah type. There is the Jonah type of sleep where you are trying to hide, where you're trying to curl up under the covers, where you're trying to drink enough of the bottle to where you don't think anymore, where you're trying to just hide from all the pain and all the suffering and all the affliction and just pretend like it's not there. But then there is also the Jesus kind of sleep. The Jesus kind of sleep who knows that these things are actually in the Lord's hands and who knows that he has the authority to control the wind and the waves and so he is at rest, at peace. And so as afflictions come, you want to think about how am I going to sleep through this? Am I going to sleep scared that God's actually not going to take care of it, sleep trying to hide from the pain of it, or am I going to pray, knowing that God is in control, have the peace which surpasses all understanding, and then sleep well through it all anyway? So that's just an interesting thing about sleep there. But the story is sad for Jonah. It's not like Christ sleeping, when Jonah is sleeping. When Christ is sleeping, he simply wakes up and takes care of the problem. When Jonah is sleeping, he has to be awoken. Not by unfaithful people like Jesus had to be awoken by. But Jonah has to be awoken by people who end up in the long run actually being very faithful. And that's what's sad is that they're not even Christian when they do this. And this is another thing to notice about interacting with the unbelieving world or inter interacting with unbelievers. This is a sad thing that happens in our world is that sometimes... We are so afraid of our own gospel. We are so afraid of the gifts that Christ has given us to give to the world and to proclaim to the world that sometimes the world actually has to act more Christian than we do on our behalf. The captain has to go down to the ship and wake up Jonah and tell him, hey, buddy, it's time to pray to your God. And you can think about how this happens in the world today. I often think about things like youth sports, that in youth sports today, a coach will simply demand that they be there to practice on Sunday morning, plus many more hours during the week, Wednesday nights, all of it. A coach will simply demand that they spend, the family spends exorbitant amounts of money 
on equipment and on travel expenses so that the child can be part of this club and maybe, maybe get a scholarship one day, which they probably spend as much money in the youth sport as they do that the scholarship would give and they could just actually put that money in an IRA or something and save it for college later on. But coaches and youth sports will simply demand these things of our youth today. But then in the church, if we say, if pastors say, yeah, I actually expect you to come to church every week, then we are at best ignored, or at worst berated. Pastor, how dare you would say that you should be in church every week? Or if we say, yeah, we expect that you give some amount of your income, every month to the church to help the functioning of the church, again, potentially ignored, potentially called a legalist of some kind, even though the Bible talks about these things all the time. Or also think about how today so many people are caught up in self-help podcasts or self-help YouTube videos or self-help books to help them learn how to live a fulfilled life, listening to non-Christians like Jordan Peterson or Joe Rogan or I don't know who else people listen to, but listening to all these non-Christians just to tell them how to live because the church is afraid to talk about how you should live to live a fulfilled life. The church is afraid to say things that you should do in your life because we're afraid of being called legalistic again or some other slur like that. And so it is a condemnation to us, just like it is a condemnation to Jonah, when the captains of this world, when the non-Christians of this world have to step up and tell people how to live, how to be, what to do, and so on and so forth. It is a condemnation to us. And when he wakes up and the lot falls on him, God's providence is shown in that, by the way. God's providence has been shown this whole time that God is the one controlling the sea. He is the one controlling the captain. He is the one controlling Jonah. And now the lot falls on Jonah. Jonah, again, has a simple message. And the mariners want to know, who are you? Where did you come from? Think of all these questions that they're asking. They're interested in what Jonah has to say. And I think that's another mistake we make when we're evangelizing, when we have this simple message, is that we think again that people, they just don't want to hear this, they might not want to hear this. We think that people, that our message is not interesting anymore. But I would actually contend that people do think the message is interesting. It's true we live in a more and more post-Christian society, but maybe that's just because we haven't been bold enough to say what we really believe. Maybe that's because we haven't been bold enough to say really what all of the Christian life entails. I think oftentimes we have been so soft in our message and not hard enough like the coach of the youth sports to say what we actually expect, what we actually think about what the Bible says, that oftentimes people do get bored. They just think that you are half-hearted about your message. But when Jonah is clear about his message, the people are actually interested. And the simple message again is this. I am a Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the Lord who actually made heaven and earth, the sea and the dry land. And they listen to him. It's amazing. So try that sometime. Whenever the time arises, whenever you're in these conversations, simply say boldly what you think. I am a Christian. I fear the Lord. I actually think he made all of heaven and earth, and he designed it to work in a certain way, and that his commands are true, and he has expectations of me, and if I don't live up those, to those commands, then I am sinning, and if I do not repent of my sins, then I will go to hell. It's a simple message. And see how people react to that. See what people react to when you are actually serious about what you think. If you don't take yourself seriously, how do you expect anyone else to take you seriously? That's true for the church, too. If we don't take ourselves seriously, how is anyone going to take us seriously? So they simply ask him, then, what they need to do. Who knows if they even believe at this point, but they at least grant him 
that he is firm in his belief that God made heaven and earth. And so if that's true, Jonah, what do we need to do? And I find that new converts are like this. After a little pushback, which you do see with the mariners here, that they don't immediately want to do, excuse me, what's going on? That they don't immediately want to do what Jonah tells them to do. But after answering a few questions, after a little pushback, after seeing how it all works, the new converts are actually very willing to do what is said to be expected of them. Oftentimes, it is new converts who are the most fervent in belief when you teach them what the scriptures say, what the catechism says, what is expected of them, so on and so forth. I'll put it this way, it's often, actually in fact, it's almost never new converts unless they came from a church where something else, something contrary was taught, and then maybe this is one of the questions, but new converts basically never have a problem with things like closed communion. They basically never have a problem with things like women reading in the church or things like that. You simply show them what the scriptures say, and then they say, yep, that's pretty clear. If I'm going to believe this, this is what the Bible says, and so we're going to do it. But it is people who have let other temptations and let false teaching come in that then they are tempted to be half-hearted about it. But notice these mariners who were complete pagans until Jonah gave them the simple message, they are willing to do what it takes. And so they cast him into the sea. They cast him into the sea. Yeah. And notice that Jonah, that was probably hard for him to say. It was probably hard for him to be so bold and so clear about what needed to be done because for him he meant death. But yet he was willing to bear death because he believed. And as he believed, he was also saved. The Lord saved him. He sent a great fish to swallow him up. And it is no surprise that he swallowed him up for three days and for three nights because that is a symbol Jesus preaches of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He saved him by Jesus' blood. That's how the Lord always saves. The providence of the Lord is evident again in the very midst of death. Jonah remained bold. He repented of his sins of fear. He became bold, and the Lord saved him. And so even in the very hard times, in the very midst of death, even in the times of persecution, even in the times when you don't know exactly what to say, the Lord will be there for you, too. And so I'll leave you with this. Do what you need to do as God has called you to do it. There is no need, nor is there even a way to hide from your Christian calling. The presence of the Lord is everywhere. You have faith. You have Christ. You know what must be done. But your message has to be simple. It does not need to be complicated and so proclaimed. And do what you know you need to do according to God's holy law. If the young in faith can do it, you can too. And even when you struggle in these things, as Jonah did, the Lord will provide for you. He will provide for you as he provided for Jonah, whether he was in Tarshish or whether he was in Nineveh, whether he was in the belly of the fish or in the belly of the ship, whether he was in the storm-tossed waves or whether he was on the sand in the heat of the day, the Lord provided for him, and he will provide for you too. The blood of Christ is shed for you. The three days and the three nights have been accomplished, and it is yours. And so take it, and boldly take it up, and go forth in his peace. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ said to his apostles, Whoever confesses me before men, I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. 
Lift up your hearts, therefore, to the God of all grace, and joyfully give answer to what I now ask you in the name of the Lord. Do you this day, in the presence of God and of this congregation, acknowledge the gifts that God gave you in your baptism? Yes, I do. Do you renounce the devil and all his works and all his ways? Yes, I renounce them. Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty, in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, and in the Holy Spirit? Yes, I believe in God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you hold all the prophetic and apostolic scriptures to be the inspired word of God and the doctrine of the Evangelical Lutheran Church, drawn from them and confessed in the small catechism, small catechism to be faithful and true? I do. Do you intend to hear the word of God and receive the Lord's Supper faithfully? I do, by the grace of God. Do you intend to live according to the word of God and in faith, word, and deed remain true to God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, even to death? I do, by the grace of God. Do you intend to continue steadfast in this confession in church and to suffer all, even death, rather than fall away from it? I do, by the grace of God. Do you desire to become a member of this congregation? I do. Will you support the work our gracious Lord has given this congregation with your prayers and the gifts God has given you? I will, with the help of God. Upon this, your confession of faith, I acknowledge publicly that you are a member of the Evangelical Lutheran Church and now of this congregation. Receive the Lord's Supper and participate with us in all the blessings of salvation that our Lord has given to his church. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand for prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for your great goodness in bringing this, your Son, to the knowledge of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and enabling him both with the heart to believe and with the mouth to confess his saving name. Grant that by your word and spirit he may continue steadfast in the one true faith and the fellowship of this congregation, as together we await the day when all who have fought the good fight of faith shall receive the crown of righteousness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Unto you, the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.